You'll be aware of this Public Health England document that Channel 4 News has seen that says they expect 80% of the population to be infected and perhaps 15% to be hospitalised. Are those sorts of percentages that you recognise at a UK level and a Scottish level? They are. They're, the numbers are concerning and they're the kind of numbers we've been working with for the last few weeks. They're not all going to happen on Wednesday, which is one of the reasons why the method we're trying to apply in Scotland and the UK is to smooth that hospitalisation over time so that we protect the vulnerable and we protect our health service. But if those numbers are potentially correct, you're talking about in England almost 8 million people requiring hospitalisation. In Scotland, would it be about 800,000? Without mitigation. So if we did nothing, that's what the science tells us. If we do stuff, and you can't argue yet that we haven't been doing stuff, and we're going to have to do more things over the next few weeks, even today, there may be choices made around what the next stages are. With mitigation, that number comes down significantly. However, don't misunderstand me, this is going to be a challenge for all of the UK health services over the next few months. We're not going to make that disappear. So your expectation is if the measures you're taking work, then we're not going to see 8 million people in hospital. That's correct. But we are going to see people in hospital with this virus. And to be honest, some people are going to die of the disease this virus causes. The vast majority of people are going to recover. They're going to have minor illness. They're going to stay at home for seven days, like the advice says, and they're going to recover and they're going to go back to their daily lives. Another revelation from that document was that NHS staff in England wouldn't be routinely tested. Will they be routinely tested in Scotland? So we're looking in Scotland at what we call critical workers. And critical workers, the, the simplest group is probably, imagine those working in the nuclear power industry or those working in our uh, nuclear submarines. Or, so we are looking at categories of critical workers. In Scotland, critical workers will include health and care workers and we will test them. The only reason for that though is not so we know something special about the disease. The reason we do that is so we can get them back to work in the front line of whatever it is they do, whether they're running the police control room or running the intensive care unit at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow. Test them if they're showing symptoms? Correct. How many test kits then are there and how many NHS staff are there? So the numbers uh, uh, don't really make much sense to, to compare one with the other. We have absolutely adequate testing in Scotland. In fact, Glasgow is now doing the confirmatory testing, so we're not having to send any tests anywhere else. We are absolutely confident we can test the communities we need. There's, there's another very important testing point. Scotland will this week move to population level testing, moving to potentially testing 1.2 million people to allow us to monitor the disease over time. We have to look after the individuals, which is what you're talking about, but we also have to look after the population. We have to know when to intervene at a population level, and we only know that if we know what's happening with the virus across the whole country. So you anticipated you would like to test and you have the capacity to test 1.2 million people in Scotland? Those 1.2 million people won't all be on the same day. So we will test people with symptoms in what we call our sentinel practices. They are practices that we already use for testing for seasonal flu, for testing for other diseases. It's a public health measure that allows us to monitor disease over a population. Now remember, if you come to hospital with severe symptoms and you're really sick, of course we will test you and we will treat you. And the health services in the country are ready for that eventuality. People might be wondering why this sort of community testing hasn't been happening already when the World Health Organization has very clearly implored countries to test and trace every single case. So are we, we, at the moment, testing and tracing every single case? No, we're not. We did that in phase one. We were on this program and others talking about the containment phase of the virus. And that was the advice in the containment phase. Find the case, see where they've travelled from, test their contacts, put them in homes. Now we're in a different phase. We're in the delay phase of the virus. The virus is here. I, I would love to be able to come on your program and say we can get rid of this virus. If we just all hunker down, the virus will go away. It's not going to happen. So now we have to delay the spread of the virus to allow the vulnerable to be protected and the health service to manage. So that's why the testing regime changes now. For, for very good scientific reasons. So we test those with really bad symptoms and then treat them, but we also test at a population level to know when to intervene at a population level.
Do you understand why there is public anxiety when they hear that sort of messaging from the WHO saying that they want every case, every case to be tested? And here you are citing our own scientific evidence for saying that's not happening in the UK. I understand public anxiety. I, c I can't miss it. I have family. I have 79-year-old parents. I have nieces and nephews who are at school today. The WHO guidance is for 194 countries. They have a different job from the Scottish Government and the UK Government. They have to have guidance that applies in Senegal, in Somalia, in Syria and in Scotland. So when it reaches the country, it shouldn't be a surprise that that guidance would be nuanced and changed and adapted to what that country's health service can do and should do. So our health service looks very different from the health service in South Korea or in Japan. So we are adapting the best science available, including the WHO advice and what we see in other countries as we monitor the virus and its spread and what our scientists tell us about what we should do for our populations. So there is divergence between the approach that the UK and Scotland is taking from the messaging that we hear from the WHO. So we think we're using the WHO guidance to inform our approach to the four UK countries. So Shetland looks very, very different, even from Glasgow, never mind from Tuscany. So the health services, the care systems that we have in each of these contexts varies. So it would be foolish of us to, to take some kind of cooker cutter approach from somewhere else in the world and apply it to a Scottish, Welsh, Irish or English context. So we have to take the best advice we can from the epidemiologists and from the behavioural scientists, add that into what our culture, our society can do and should do and then apply that to our country. People don't look People don't need to look very far to see a radically different approach. The Irish Prime Minister said this weekend, he said that people who have been out this weekend should avoid contact with seniors or people with chronic diseases. You could make them very, very sick. Do you believe that people who have been out in Scotland and the UK this weekend who have contact with elderly people could make them very, very sick? I do not believe that's necessary. I visited my parents yesterday and I will visit them again this week. I am asymptomatic. I do not have the new cough or the fever that would make me stay at home for seven days. I, I'm the last person in the world, though, to criticise other countries' uh, views. This is a hard thing to solve. It's just not straightforward. I'm in touch with my counterparts in Ireland, in other parts of the world. You would expect us to do that. The chief medical officers are in touch with theirs. So other countries can choose what they do for their demographics and their science. I can tell you that in Scotland and the UK, we are following that science really, really closely. But cases can be transmitted when people are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic? They can, but it's unusual. We learn more about the virus all the time as cases rise in other parts of the world and in the UK. So one of the reasons for delay, in fact, is to allow us to do more research, both on the virus itself and its effect on the population, leading eventually to better treatment vaccine, etc. So the more we learn about the virus, the better. It appears from around the world that the vast majority of transmission is in symptomatic individuals. That makes sense because it's a droplet spread. So it's spread by you coughing, sneezing, other, other things. It's not in the air. It's not an aerosol virus. So therefore you have to take it from a surface or a human being and put it in you. So you have to touch your nose, your eyes or your mouth. So if we wash our hands, clean our surfaces, then the virus can't get into us. You say, yeah, it's about transmission between people and people will have gone to work, to schools, to just to the, going about their daily life today, on buses, on trains, they'll have been in confined spaces with other individuals. Many people in the rest of the world are calling for quite aggressive social distancing measures. In Ireland again, asking for people to stay six feet apart from other people. They will look and ask, why are we again the outlier? So we believe that social distancing, when appropriate, is the right thing to do. And we're social distancing those with symptoms already. And over the days and weeks to come, we will have to take more measures around exactly what you describe. We have to do that at the right moment, when the, when the virus is at the stage where we think it's required. Because this is a long haul. To, to suggest that we should put older people in homes 
and lock them in for four months. That gives us a whole lot of new problems. Who's that suggesting that? Sorry. Other people. So, so there, are, there are suggestions that if we lock down the country, that if we close the border, close the schools, get everybody in their houses, then that's going to solve our problem. The, the problem with that is you'd have to do that for a long, long time. So, so we don't think that's required at this stage. There may be a point at which we choose to do more. We tell the public to do other things. But we have to do that when the curve is at the right point in order to protect the public. What harm could come from people keeping their distance at the moment and staying six feet apart? So you, you can't keep 60 million people six feet apart. It's if only we're as simple as that. I, I honestly wish it was like a video game. And if we pressed A, B would happen. But, but it isn't. It's, it's human behavior and protecting that vulnerable community. Now, people with symptoms, let's go over it again, people with symptoms with a new cough and or a fever should stay home. But those without symptoms can go about their business as normal for now. Do you worry, you're asking people with symptoms, they may even be quite mild symptoms compared to what people are used to, you're asking them to stay at home and do something they've never done before with these mild symptoms. Do you worry that they're going to do that? That message is not going to go through, get through, when at the same time they're hearing other messages like, well, we're all gonna get it anyway. So I've been challenged by, in the last few days, in this newfound media career of mine, where those who think I'm not taking it seriously enough and those who think I'm taking it too seriously. The, the balance is really difficult here. And you see in other countries and other places where, where that balance is really challenging. So we need the public to do things the public is not used to doing. And we're going to have to get them to do that for quite a long time. It's why the panic buying is, is a challenge for us because we want everybody to wash their hands, not just you. So leave soap for other people. So, so we, need the, we need the society to behave in a particular way. So therefore, I, the, the interventions, carefully chosen for scientific reasons, and the timing of the interventions for the same scientific reasons are crucial. To what extent has the messaging around herd immunity, do you think, undermined this effort to get people with mild symptoms to isolate for the greater good of society? I don't think it's undermined it. There is a, there is a, a bit of work to be done in the messaging with the whole of society, those who watch Channel 4 News, but also those who don't. So I've done sports programmes. I mean, I never thought the National Clinical Director would be on a sports programme. Later today, I'm going to do a music programme. So we have to get the message out to young people, to kids, to the elderly who are worried and lonely perhaps that they're going to be left in their houses for a long period. So we have to get that messaging out that we're doing two things. We're, we're caring for the individuals who are sick and the health services are ready for that and they are getting more ready for more patients and we're protecting the population, particularly the vulnerable, at the same time. I mean, do you agree with Sir Patrick Valance, the Chief Scientific Advisor, that one of the aims of the UK government is for people to develop some immunity to this disease? I, I do. I absolutely agree with them. Because we have no choice. You can't get rid of the virus. You can wish it away, but it will not go. So therefore, we have to manage the infection safely across a whole population, while at the same time, treating the individuals who get sick. And that's why the health services are ramping up they're adjusting to allow us to be able to do that. The British Society of Immunology say we don't know yet if this novel virus will induce long-term immunity. So why are you so sure that it will when they are not? So we know that if you get it, you don't appear to get it again. So from the data, but again, we're learning all the time from data around the, around the world, and scientists, including Scottish and UK scientists, are linking with their partners in Australia, in Korea, in China, to learn more and more about this virus. But it appears very, very rare, if ever, you get it twice. So if we can manage that, that would suggest that those people will then help us get to an immunity across the whole society. These are, these are not easy decisions. But the alternative that people are offering, which is close the borders, send everybody home for a prolonged period, that, that, that doesn't, that's not without cost either. So just to be clear, this idea of herd immunity is still part of the overall strategy? I, I'm not so sure I like the, the phrase because it's, it's taken on a connotation that perhaps 
is a little bit worrying for people. What, what we're trying to do is manage the spread of the virus safely over time in the population. And that will that. lead to more people getting the virus and surviving. So getting, get, get, people getting the virus is part of our plan to deal with it. Over a sustained and long period. It, we don't have a choice that people will get the virus. Uh, can I just ask you about what measures people are taking themselves or what workplaces are taking to try and protect people from it? Because we see images from the rest of the world where there are confirmed cases and people sweep in and decontaminate the area. That is not what workplaces in this country are being advised, is it? It's not. And we expect people to take this very seriously, but not to panic. We expect people with symptoms to stay home. And over the next days and weeks, there will be other interventions that we will use at an individual and a population level to, to deal with the rise in viral cases that we will see inevitably over the next few weeks. But we are not doing the contact tracing and the individual extreme measures that we took in the beginning of this viral uh, pandemic, which we did do across the UK. Now we're in a second phase, the delay phase, which doesn't require us to do that anymore. Uh, just want to um, share with you an email from Glasgow University to its staff after it had three confirmed cases. They say that the Health Protection Scotland guidance is that if you are symptom free um, after seven days, um, you can go back uh, to work. Um, there is no need for contacts of known cases to self isolate. In fact, unless they develop uh, a fever or persistent cough, and the advice is that there is no value in deep cleaning spaces used by confirmed cases. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. The Health Protection Scotland website is a great source of calming advice. For the public, the best place to go is for Scotland, for nhsinform.scot, although I understand other countries are using it almost as much as Scottish people are using it. So there's public advice, but there's also then professional advice for businesses, for care homes, for other places where people congregate, and Health Protection Scotland have been very helpful in that advice. So where there's been a confirmed case in workplaces, we're not deep cleaning those areas where that person worked? We are not. It, can you see why that might be a cause for concern for people if they're worried about contagion? I can see why the whole viral pandemic is a cause for concern for people. What, what we're trying to do is calmly and over time deal with it. I can tell people that the health services in the UK are ready to treat those who are sick today, irrespective of if they have the virus or not. There will be road traffic accidents today. People will have strokes today. The health services are ready. And I can assure them that at a population level, the four chief medical officers, the politicians, the clinical advisors like me are in lockstep with how to deal with this. Uh, in terms of the intensive care capacity, we've been told that will double in Scotland. Can you give us the time frame? It will double when it requires to double. So just now, we don't need double the intensive care beds because we don't have patients yet who are that sick. So we will double as and when that's required. And we will cut back on elective surgery as and when that is required. It also allows us to then train staff to be ready for that intake of, of patients. And Sorry, just, just to clarify, if it required, it could be doubled this week, if necessary? It could absolutely be doubled this week. It will not be necessary this week. It could be. The that's that's, that's going to be a reassurance for a lot of people. And in terms of ventilators, we've heard um, in England how many they have and the drive to try and get more. How many ventilators are there in Scotland? We have enough ventilators for every intensive care bed, including the doubling of the intensive care beds. So that's and, around 400. And more. 